Hey there, I'm Tracy Rigdon, and this is the Contrast Project Lounge Podcast. In this podcast, each episode is a journey through captivating interviews, engaging dialogues, and personal anecdotes that explore the depths of arts, culture, politics, and everything in between. My goal? To leave you inspired, informed, and entertained. Often random, but always relevant, always real, and practically nothing is off limits. So whether you're an art aficionado, a political junkie, or simply someone seeking a fresh perspective, this podcast is for you. Are you ready for this? Let's do it. Welcome back to the program, guys. I have joining me today uh, Jacksonville's very own author, educator, Mr. Tim Gilmore. Good friend, Tim Gilmore. Tim, how you doing today? I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. Um, you know, you're. I've been following your show for a while now, and it's it's coming <laughs> a long way. So thanks for thanks for having me here. I'm I'm thrilled to talk to you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a long road and things have been changing one season after the next. But, uh, yeah, I, I just keep having more and more fun with it. Uh, yeah. Let's first talk about uh, before we uh, before we start talking about your latest book, uh, which is fascinating, by the way. Uh, let's talk about something that uh, that came up when I was doing some of my research. And of course, I've been reading your stuff on your website, Jack Psycho Geo, for a long time. Uh, and, and for my listeners, for my followers, uh, you definitely have to check it out. And I'll leave the links in the descriptions down here. Um, the aspect of spirit of place and psychogeography. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you for asking that. So, um, Jack Psychogeo is short for um, uh, Jacksonville Psychogeography. Psychogeography is a portmanteau word for um, the psychology of geography, which is something like the spirit of place. There's this great uh, Latin phrase, uh, genius loci, which means the spirit of place. And it's something that I have uh, maybe always been been really interested in. And I think it's something that affects people uh, whether or not they're aware of it, uh, you know, uh, different places affect us in different ways. Uh, you know, architects know this, urban planners know this, um, uh, historians, I think, uh, are, are aware of this, um, different parts of a town affect us different ways, different cities affect us different ways. So, um, I, I've, I've, I'm really interested in the concept of, of psychogeography. Um, there are, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a loosely defined, uh, I don't think movement, movement is probably too cohesive uh, a word, but in arts and literature, um, some people trace it back to Edgar Allan Poe stories, like the man in the crowd or to, um, uh, the, uh, the poetry of Char Baudelaire in Paris. Um, and, um, uh, more recently, um, there are people like the, the, English novelist Peter Aykroyd, uh, whose work very much deals with that, uh, or um, uh, Ian Sinclair, who is a uh, an English writer who uh, writes you know thousand page books about wandering the whole periphery of London on foot and things like that. So, um, so it can mean a lot of different things, um, but it's kind of central to um, the way I, I think about things and the the way I approach digging into into the stories of my hometown which is jacksonville oh yeah uh the the subject matters uh, you know in in the articles on your website are, are just the the research that goes into that stuff is uh it it, it can be mind-boggling i i've looked at i've looked into some of those things that you talk about and 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 sometimes I scratch my scratch my head. You know, I I'm a Jacksonville native too, and and a lot of the things you dig up, I've never even heard of. <laughs> you know, I mean, I grew up here, and um, maybe you and I have some of the same situations uh, in that. You know, when when I was a kid growing up here, 
I think everybody I knew said they couldn't wait to get out. You know, they said Jacksonville is a boring place. They, um, uh, you know, there was there was a bit of a brain drain problem. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that means since about me since I stuck <laughs> around, but. Um, <laughs> But, uh, you know, so somewhere along the way, I thought, well, you know, why are there certain places and certain cities that seem to have this um, outgrowth, this, this incredible um, plethora of writers and artists that come out of it? Uh, and then I started thinking about Jacksonville differently and looking around differently and seeing that, in fact, there's, there's quite, a, quite an incredible arts and literary community in Jacksonville. And, um, you know, just taking the blinders off of my eyes and looking at some of the historic architecture that's here and finding out that when you dig into uh, a place, when you dig into the landscape, there are always stories there. I think that's the case wherever you are. <laughs> and, uh, and the more stories you dig into, you find that they're connected underground to all of these other stories. And it just... Um, becomes something that just endlessly feeds itself. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm fascinated by uh, you know the uh, some of the things that have happened in Jacksonville, um, whether whether they be you know positive you know outcomes or and and we've got some we've got some 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 dark past in Jacksonville too. That's absolutely true, and I think it's I think it's important to um, you know to deal with things honestly. Um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, that, that's, that is a big part of why, um, history is important. I don't think history is a study of the past. I think it's a study of the present. It's why are we, um, the way we are, why, why does our world look the way it looks? What are the forces that, uh, you know, um, socially, culturally, psychologically, um, move us in ways that we're not even conscious of a lot of the time. Um, so, uh, it's absolutely necessary to be honest about those things. And, uh, I, I believe in truth and reconciliation. You can't, uh, you can't make the place, the community that you're in better, uh, until you acknowledge the things that you, you need to improve. Right. And, um, mm -hmm. every city has an ugly past, um, as sure. well as beautiful past, um, Jacksonville has has uh, has plenty of both. Um, obviously, it's got um, you know it's got a, a, a pretty violent um, racial history. It's got yes. Um, it's it's got a violent it's got a violent history. Period. Actually, uh, and um, but I think all of those things are fascinating when you dig into them and necessary to deal with if if we want this this place to be the best place it can be. Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, I'm a I'm a child of the '60s, and uh, a mm -hmm. lot of a lot of the bad things continued to happen during the '60s, um, such as you know the 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 riots on the East Side, the uh, uh, Axe Handle Saturday, 1960. Some of those things, because yeah. I was born in I was born in 1960, uh, so uh, some of those things I never even heard about until I was much older. Uh, we didn't, we weren't given that information. Uh, we were shielded from the, uh, my parents. Uh, basically, it just wasn't talked about. Yeah, uh, and it's not just you. And it's not just, um, <clears throat> you know, your parents that, that did the shielding. And so many ways, um, the, the segregation of Jacksonville um, it wasn't just a geographical thing. It was a psychological thing. Um, white Jacksonville, you know, so often uh, had very little idea of what was happening in black Jacksonville. You can see that when you dig mm -hmm. into the musical history of La Villa and, the, you know, the 19 teens and the 1920s. Uh, there's all of this incredible stuff happening there that um, white Jacksonville uh, knew very little, if anything, about. Uh, right. And uh, when you move into the civil rights era and then when you move into uh, the 1960s, um, you know, these two separate worlds that were right next to each other, um, they collide. And um, white Jacksonville is suddenly going, you know, what's happening? And in so yeah. many ways, black, black Jacksonville 
Black Jacksonville knew what was going on in White Jacksonville, but the opposite was not true. So, sure. And, you know, you mentioned Axe Handle Saturday. Um, local media blacked a lot of that out, you know. They did not report on it, even though uh, Life Magazine was was reporting on it. Um, there was mm-hmm. there was very little of any uh, uh, reporting on it happening here locally. Right, right. And, and that brings me uh, right into the topic of your recent book, uh, The Culture Wars of yeah. Warren Folks. Uh, and it explores the life of, you know, uh, you know, a self-avowed white supremacist and uh, segregationist, uh, uh, you know, uh, elaborate, you know, for us on your motivation for writing this, you know, biography or broader message that it conveys about the South mm. uh, and, and, you know, particularly Jacksonville and, and you know, that climate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, so, uh, so Warren Folks, as you said, was a, a, a self-avowed, and I think it's important to say self-avowed because there were white supremacists who weren't necessarily even aware that they were white supremacists, right? Um, but he was yep. a self-avowed white supremacist who um, ran for office, uh, multiple offices uh, from the 1960s um, uh, up through the 80s and to um, the early 90s even. And um, what what first brought my attention to him, I had heard of him before. Um, Rodney Hurst in his, his book, It Was Never mm-hmm. About a Hot Dog and a Coke, has a chapter, and the chapter is called Warren Folks. Um, I, I had heard of him before, but I had kind of forgotten about him. And then um, last November, I was... Uh, I was looking into um, book bans that had happened in Florida um, previously uh, because of uh, some of the things that are happening politically now and that have only, you know, that only accelerated in the months after that uh, with, um, you know, um, the governor and the Florida legislature um, banning books, banning the teaching or trying to ban anyway, the teaching of, of, of black history uh and uh you know uh anything that uh, they often focus on uh you know the the making of of white children uncomfortable uh and i had kind of always thought that part of what education has to do is to make us uncomfortable in order to to sure. face um some things that are difficult to face so uh so i started looking into book bans and um this was last november so almost a year ago and uh i i ran into the story of warren folks um discovering uh that the jacksonville public library had a book by the the crime novelist mickey spillane that he he thought um well first of all that uh, mickey spillane's wife um, posed naked on the cover. You can't see anything. You know, it's from the side, but clearly, I mean, uh, uh, Spillane and his wife were up front about doing that to to increase book sales. Um, so uh, when Folk sees this book uh, and he starts to look through it, uh, he sees things that, you know, that he thinks are, are obscene, um, highlights them, calls them, he calls them, quote, hardcore pornography. Uh, and he demands uh, that um, the full city council come together uh, in an emergency session, which did not happen. Uh, but um, he wanted all funding cut for the Jacksonville Public Library System until every book in the library system had been screened. And I thought, this sounds so familiar, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I... I uh, I went downtown to the main library, uh, to the uh, the Florida room on the fourth floor, to see um, how much of of a file um, they would, you know, the uh, the Florida Times Union's um, archives are there. See how much of a, a file the TU ever had on Warren Folks, um, and you know, when you ask, you don't know. You can have a pretty good idea, but you don't know if they're going to have anything or not, or how big it'll be. So they bring back this. It's just like two or three feet you know, this, this stack, uh, <laughs> of, um, files on Warren folks. I just, I could not, I'm just flipping through it and I just can't believe what I'm seeing. And 
I don't know if I would have chosen to um, to write uh, an entire book about Warren Folks um, in previous years, but it seems so much to fit the the cultural political moment that we're in uh, that um, you know I thought I have to do this. I have to um, you know I have to have to um, track down this guy's story and and find out what he was about and why. It seems as though he left a lot of breadcrumbs, though, because he was one to be writing a lot of letters to people. <laughs> he did, yeah. Breadcrumbs, that's exactly right, yeah. Um, right, he did. He, um, he, uh, he sent letters to, uh, to reporters constantly, he sent letters to uh, political leaders constantly. Uh, and these, were, these weren't just, um, a lot of them weren't just, you know, short notes. Um, a lot of these were, uh, uh, you know, seven or eight page single spaced letters on <laughs> um, legal size, you know, eight and a half by 14 inch paper. Uh, and then he would handwrite things around the sides and down around the bottom and up the other other side. Um, he he um, he definitely uh, left a significant trail. Uh, you know, he uh, he, uh, he he always kept himself in the headlines. He moved from one kind of culture war conspiracy theory to another. Uh, and and um, so, yeah, he left he left uh, he left quite a fascinating, um, troubling, but um, interesting narrative behind. He definitely did. Yeah, I, I uh, saw some images of some of the letters that mm. he had sent. And, and when you see writing right. like that, when you see writing like that and the envelopes that they were sent in with swastikas on them and stuff, you think mm -hmm. to yourself, man, this guy was deep. <laughs> uh, he, you know, it's, I asked myself, um, you, you can't not, I think, um, how someone who had so much um, so much hatred um, could um, sustain that for so long? I mean, you know, we all get angry, right? Um, and it, it it feels like um, it, extreme emotions have a tendency sometimes to to kind of burn themselves out. And I feel like um, I just asked myself, how did someone carry so much hate for so long without it just absolutely eating him alive you know and yeah. uh, i i i think and, and and i think it's an important question for maybe for all times but certainly for the time we're living in now you know we see so much um so much racism we see the 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 the, the um the mass shooting the racist racist mass shooting that happened outside edward waters um recently and mm -hmm. um, I think hate is its own kind of fuel, and it's remarkable that it doesn't burn itself out, but it seems to perpetuate itself uh, and, and, and fuel itself. And in Warren Folks' case, it did for decade after decade after decade. Oh, yeah. And, and he even went so far as to... Uh... It started started a little thing with the with the church community and and disavowed you know membership with the you know the broader Christian movement and started his own conservative Christian church in his barber shop. He did. He um, I think that I mean he was he was uh, he was uh, he was extreme. He was absolutely far <laughs> far right. But I think yes, he was. that um, you see this, you, yeah, I think you see this a lot of times in um, uh, intense political movements, though, where there is, um, there's so much passion um, that m maybe inevitably uh, it ends up with a lot of infighting. I mean, maybe that's, you know, what you can see right now in um, you know, the Republican Congress where, um, you know, they, they, uh, they seem to come to an impasse every couple of couple of months, if not weeks, and they just, you know, fired yeah. their speaker, and they can't seem to to get another one in, in its place. But Warren Folks, uh, you know, he he um, 
shortly after he came to Jacksonville, he was involved with the um, uh, uh, the American Nazi Party. Um, he quickly um, disavowed himself of them, not because of anything uh, we might think logical, like you know they're they're Nazis. Uh, yeah. But because of of yeah, but because of ego um, uh, headbutting, and he did that kind of thing regularly. He had a falling out. He early on supported um, George Wallace uh, for president. George Wallace, the Alabama governor, most famously, who said, "You know, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever." He supported George Wallace for um, for president. Then had a big. Um, falling out with um, the um, the Wallace folks uh, and um, that culminated in this big shouting match um, uh, on on Adam Street downtown uh, and and he did the same thing with his uh, church uh, he uh, his father had been uh, a um, Church of Christ minister in Ocala and uh, at one point, Warren Folks joins uh, uh, the Woodstock Park Church of Christ in, in Jacksonville, um, has this enormous falling out with them. Uh, they actually went so far as to remove him from, from the church uh, because uh, their, their official wording was sowing discord. But, uh, you know, he, um, he, uh, uh, everything was about race for him. And so um, he was upset when the church had... Um, black visitors and welcomed them. So he uh, um, he broke off from the from that church and, um, as you said, started something called the Conservative Church of Christ um, in his barber shop uh, on on Adam Street in in Jacksonville. So that was that was a pattern that uh, he kept to throughout his career of being a culture warrior. And it wound him up in jail more than a couple of times. That's true. Yeah. Um, he, uh, I think it's impossible to know now. Um, <laughs> and the records don't exist anymore. How many times he was arrested. Um, the, um, the time that he spent the longest in, in um, jail was actually for... Um, disrupting um, activities at um, uh, NAS Jacks, Naval Air Station Jacksonville. Um, <clears throat> he was uh, he was protesting the way the Navy had dealt with um, what he called um, black mutiny. Um, and these were protests that happened um, on, on board ship in California, um, the early 70s. He protested them here in Jacksonville. Um, came onto base and disrupted um, various activities. There was this, this strange, long instance of this, this slow-speed chase that happened across base where um, um, a, a security officer um, on a vehicle almost pinned him against a tree. Um, <laughs> but um, for uh, those particular activities, he... Um, he he served 150 days in in jail, which was his, his you know the longest that he he spent. Uh, but if you added it all up cumulatively, who knows how how long it would have been? He he went to uh you know he would spend um, time in jail quite often for you know a day or two for contempt of court because he would just be a. Uh, uh, he he wouldn't uh, he wouldn't obey the simplest things that a judge would ask him to do, for example. So he 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 right. was in jail quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> and you talk about contempt contempt of uh, you know the court or you know the the establishment contempt that he had. Uh, he even at mm. uh, one time I read uh, carried his shotgun into into one of the uh, office buildings downtown. He did. Uh, the reason that uh, the mayor's office first got uh, enhanced security uh, to deal with the, the possible threat of gun violence was because of Warren Folks. Um, it's interesting, you know, um, gun laws are actually a lot looser in Florida than, than they used to be and, and just about everywhere in the U.S., 
uh, for years, Warren folks could not get a gun permit. It did not keep him, however, from having guns, um, from firing them in public, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, in his quest to get uh, a gun permit, he, uh, he took his shotgun into the mayor's office. Uh, and, uh, when his shotgun was, um, was, was taken away from him, he, he said he was going to stay in the mayor's office until, you know, for however many days until he had the chance to speak with the mayor. Uh, so he was arrested for that as well. And, um, and, and this is the, um, the first time that the, the, the Jacksonville mayor's office has, uh, you know, is really taking, um, the threat of uh of gun violence seriously uh he even did a kind of um the the newspapers referred to it as a a victory march where um you know when they're when um workers are putting up uh uh you know enhanced security features he he goes and walks walks by the mayor's office and um with his uh, he always wore this homburg and this plaid coat and uh newspaper photographers took a picture of him great big smile on his face and 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 referred to that as his his victory lap he was quite the character i'll tell you i'll tell you the uh the 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 breadth of uh and like you say Mm. you know like i said earlier you know the 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 enormous amount of research that went into this. But again, the man, the man left you so many breadcrumbs. And like you say, at the library, they had a stack of stuff on him. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And he wrote, he wrote reporters regularly. He threatened reporters regularly. He, um, uh, he, you know, (sighs) most of us leave very little behind, you know, I mean, not so much now because everything is recorded. Uh, (laughs) But, um, you know, historically, I mean, if you're, if you're, um, if you're digging for records from, from someone who lived a hundred years ago, um, you find what you can find. Um, uh, Folks left this enormous legacy behind and it's, um, it's, uh, you know, it's deeply troubling, um, but you kind of also have to ask, uh, in some ways, he would fit in more now with, uh, I think, the political landscape than he did at the time. He was, he was seen as an extremist at the time, and, uh, and he definitely was, you know, um, when Life magazine came through and... Um, uh, took pictures inside Folks's barbershop in 1965. Um, some of the people who were there uh, included um, Klansmen who had uh, bombed the home of Donald Godfrey, who was a six-year-old boy who was the first black child at Lackawanna Elementary School. Uh, and uh, he and his mother survived because they were on the opposite side of the house. Um, uh and so he was certainly extreme, um, but I think that uh, if you look at today's politi- political landscape, if if uh, someone was able to coach him into um, being careful with his rhetoric, I think he would fit in a lot more now than than he uh, than he ever did in his time. You're probably right. You're probably right. Uh, uh, let's move on. Uh... With your now, you you have been uh, active in the community, uh, it, an, an advocate for civil rights, an advocate for you know uh, taking down the Confederate monuments, uh, a, a number of things, the the book bans, of course, uh, and uh, you know you were once involved with a civil rights advisory or history task force. Is that correct? Hmm. Yeah, um, this was, was 2018, um, and uh, uh, I was on the, um, uh, 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 it, was a, it was a city council task force um, that was looking into um, getting Jacksonville to join um, the National Civil Rights Trail. 
which at the time, um, Jacksonville, uh, unfortunately chose not to do, but I think that that is, I think that new leadership may be looking at that uh, again, uh, and, and may look at things differently. Um, and, uh, so at that time I, I, I also served with, um, Rodney Hurst as, um, co-chair on the, the civil rights history, um, subcommittee of that task force, which was, uh, um, which is an incredible honor, you know, I mean, um, I kept saying at the time, you know, I write about civil rights. Rodney Hurst is civil rights history, you know? Yes. Um, yes. So, he lived it. <laughs> um, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, it was an honor. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm always thrilled when, uh, the things that I am obsessed by and fascinated with digging into and, and writing about, um, can can be useful in in the community and the and the city and the state somehow. Uh, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. Is uh, you know the involvement with the civil rights, you know, with your task force and and your ongoing you know activity that you seem to you know get yourself involved in on an almost regular basis. Uh, uh, how how I was going to ask you how does that shape. Uh, the way mm. you write the stuff that you write, how does that, that mm. direct involvement, you know, works, you know, to, to shape your literature, the stuff that you write. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's, that's a great point. Um, you know, uh, I guess in some ways there, there are probably some pretty obvious, uh, ways. And then, um, in some ways, I'm sure there are things I haven't, quite figured out you know i um i try to do a story for jack psycho geo every every week i don't always make it but i try uh and um i usually have um a book project also that i'm i'm, I'm working on so um one thing that happens that I, I kind of already alluded to a little bit is that one story always leads to not just another story, but maybe another five stories, you know, um, there's mm -hmm. like no way to ever be done with this thing, I think. Um, <laughs> but of course, also you have to, you have to pay attention to what's going on and let that influence uh, the kinds of stories that you want to research and, and, and write about as well. Um, so, you know, one thing, um, one project that's upcoming that, um, it's not actually my project, but I, I played an advisory role too, and I'm really excited about, um, has to do with Donald Godfrey, whom I mentioned a minute ago. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure what year it was that I first wrote about Donald Godfrey, but I've got a couple of stories about what happened there, um, with, um, uh, the Klan bombing his home um, mm -hmm. in um, Murray Hill Heights, uh, 1964, uh, when he was a first first black child, six years old, you know, first black child at Lackawanna Elementary School. And um, so I, I, I wrote the story for Jack Psycho Geo. Um, afterwards, I ended up um, actually speaking with Donald, who is now a retired diplomat uh, who uh, he lives in Ghana. Uh, and um, getting to know him over time. So um, within the last, I don't know, year and a half or so, uh, I've been working with uh, an Atlanta filmmaker named Hal Jacobs, uh, who uh, is, uh, has, has done, it's in its you know, kind of final stages now, um, a short documentary film um, called Just Another Bombing. That's the, with a question mark. That's, that's the working title. I'm not sure if that'll be the final title or not. Uh, and Donald uh, came back um, back here, uh, and his mother Iona, who lives in uh, D.C., came down. Uh, it was such an honor to to meet them, you know, and uh, just uh, it's this really jarring thing to stay. You know, the 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 house where it happened is not there anymore. Uh, but you know, we visited that site, um, talked about. Uh, what their experience was, what their experience of healing from this was, um, the fact that, um, you know, this didn't, didn't destroy them, that Donald went on to, uh, you know, to grow up and have this, this um, incredibly meaningful life. Mm -hmm. uh, so next year will be 60 years since the bombing. And uh, in February, um, 
Donald and Iona uh, will be in town and Hal Jacobs will be coming to town and um, uh, he's looking to uh, to premiere the film um, probably at Sunray um, in, in Five Points, but also, uh, you know, to have showings and discussions at a couple of other places around town. Um, so I, I think when you when you start digging into stories uh, and writing about stories, um, they all take on a life of their own. And so I keep digging into other things that I'm interested about and expanding that, but also um, they all have their own lives and they, they, a lot of the times the stories pull me back to them, you know, and it's, uh, um, it's kind of an organic thing, I suppose. <laughs> you know, you mentioned uh, Rodney Hurst there a couple of times. Uh, he has actually been scheduled to be on the podcast with me uh, a couple of weeks <laughs> ago and, and it slipped his mind. He, yeah. So we had we oh, had to really? reset. Yeah, he had something else going on and and he couldn't make it. So uh, it, we're, we we mm. had to reschedule. I'll be recording him like sometime mid November. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's fascinating. And he fellow. always does have a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and you know this last. Well, commemoration yep. of um axe handle saturday uh is the first one that a mayor has ever attended um donna mm -hmm. deacon came out and that was that was the first time it's been uh what 63 years um yeah. since axe handle saturday happened yep. and um obviously they didn't do the commemoration all of those years they didn't uh, obviously do them um early on but this is the first commemoration that uh, a, a Jacksonville mayor has ever um, has ever attended, and um, hopefully that bodes well for uh, for some things in the future. Yeah, I think uh, yeah the uh, the city government Jacksonville, the new administration Donna Deegan, uh, she is. Uh, I I believe we're going to see a lot of firsts. Uh, she was the first mayor to. Uh, uh, attend uh be the grand marshal for the recent pride parade first time of jacksonville mayor has done that ah yeah right and yeah, uh yeah. she's uh her her new administration her her inner circle very diverse mm -hmm. very inclusive right uh, in fact i yeah. i uh i interviewed uh jimmy midget the other day who is mm. now on the administration as the diversity manager for the human rights uh, so uh, a lot, a yeah, lot of good yeah. things are happening with the new administration. It's, um, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, it's not that we haven't had mayors who did good things in the past, although, no. you know, um, they, 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 they maybe get over, uh, overshadowed by some of the, the awful things that have happened sometimes. But, um, this is, um, this particular moment we're in, locally at least <laughs> is uh right. is the most hopeful politically that i have felt in a while i've felt um increasingly hopeful um culturally about jacksonville for uh, despite some some truly awful um elements of our local culture um i think um as a whole uh i i have felt increasingly hopeful about jacksonville in recent years and uh you know, so it's nice. It's nice to it's nice to feel hopeful about your town. You know, <laughs> it's something that I, it is. I have not yeah. always I have not always known. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been it's been wonderful talking to you, Tim. Uh, before we go, before we go, uh, mm. since the uh, vast majority of our listeners are in the North Florida area, and I know that I know that mm -hmm. you are uh, in favor of supporting local businesses like most of us are. Well, I'm going to say most of us are. Mm. <laughs> Where can people pick up your books in Jacksonville? Great. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's such a great question to go out on, right? Um, <laughs> well, so um, first thing, let me say that um, Jacks by Jacks uh, Literary Arts Festival, this is the 10th year. Um, yes. It'll be happening early December, so um, I'll be there. Um, Donna 
Deegan is going to read there. Um, uh, Nat Glover is going to read there. Um, but also, um, I don't think they've made all the choices yet, but um, there's always an incredible array of, um, you know, locally based writers at Jack by Jacks. It's the kind of thing that, um, you know, makes you feel in touch with your community and makes you feel proud of your community. Um, so, uh, so I want to want to give that a shout out. But um, uh, and I'll be um, doing a lit chat um, at the the main library on November fourth. Um, but uh, you the, you know, um, I absolutely as as you just indicated um, support our local businesses, um, independent businesses. So. Um, you can find my books at um, San Marco Bookstore, at uh, Shamblin Book Mine, of course, the largest independent bookstore in the southeast. Uh, uh, Shamblin's uptown, downtown. Um, there's a new bookstore on um, Park Street at Park and King called Happy Medium. Um, they've got my books. Um, you can you can find my books at um, the um, uh, the Creative Exchange um, downtown in the bottom of the, I can't remember what the building is now. It's the old Barnett Tower, <laughs> the tall gotcha. blue one. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what it's called these days. Isn't that crazy? Um, so, um, and you can, you, can, you can order my books on, on um, my website, um, but uh, I uh, absolutely love it when, when uh, I know that people are, are, are getting them from uh, our local independent booksellers. Absolutely. And, 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 uh, my, my favorite, I used to, I used to live in the urban core for a couple of years. We lived yeah. down there and, and I would walk over to Chamblin's, you know, uptown all the time, I'll go out to have, have coffee, sit out there and read the newspaper and yeah. people watch. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Absolutely. It's the, um, it's exactly the kind of business you should have in the middle of the city and it's right smack in the center so yeah yeah yeah, 100 (laughs) percent. jim it's been a joy having you here i enjoyed the conversation uh i look forward to having you on again sometime and i'll tell you the jacks by jacks thing you know i had forgot to mention it and i'm glad you did and that's coming up in december yes uh first weekend in december i can't remember what those dates are off the top of my head but first weekend um, and information um, uh, will be continuously updated, I think, at, at jacksbyjacks.com and um, also on their, their Facebook page. Very good. Very good. Well, for now, we'll say goodbye. All right, Tracy, it's always good to speak with you. So thank you so much for having me. It's been, been a lot of fun. You bet. You're welcome anytime. All right. Well, that's a wrap. Another fantastic episode of the podcast. You can find us on all the social media platforms, wherever you surf, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter X, threads, wherever. Don't forget to like, share, and comment. And on our YouTube channel, don't forget to like, share, comment, and smash that subscribe button. If you're streaming audio for the podcast, you can find us wherever you get your favorite podcast programs. In the meantime, I like to tell everybody, Take care of yourselves and each other. Until next time, peace.